Hey guys, thanks for trying science. Today we're going to be talking about evolution. So grab your packet and let's get started. We've got some homework here. So what do you think of when we think of the word evolution? Why don't you pause, take your packet out if you got it, and let's write down what you think evolution is all about. All right, welcome back. Today what we're going to do is talk about evolution. And let's see how well your definition matches up with this one that I found. Do you have anything like that? Well, a lot of people's definitions of evolution are not exactly correct because we're kind of influenced by things that we see like memes like these that are funny and cool and everything but is this really how evolution works are we really descendants of of monkeys or apes or is that a thing well let's start out our class here with what evolution is not Along with the double helix and the famous blue marble photo of the Earth taken from the space, it's probably one of the most recognizable scientific images in the world, a depiction of human evolution in just six easy steps. But of course, it's professional wrestling, and pretty much all of reality television has shown us just because something is popular doesn't mean that it's an accurate depiction of reality. Let me walk you through it. You probably recognize the naked guy on the right. That's Homo sapiens, an anatomically modern human. The guy who seems to be stalking him is labeled Cro-Magnon, a rough-looking customer who I'll talk about more in a minute. Behind him is Neanderthal. On his heels are Ramapithecus, then Oreopithecus, which sounds delicious. And finally, a tiny monkey-like early ape known as Dryopithecus. The idea of this evolving from this may seem like it's right out of the 19th century, but these images actually first appeared in 1965 in a volume published by Time Life Books called Early Man. And in its defense, the book wasn't exactly trying to say that we evolved right from that hairy little homunculus. Instead, the book, written by anthropologist F. Clark Howell, offered a relatively nuanced discussion of human evolution for the time, and it even warned against interpreting the illustration literally as a progression from one species directly to the next. But the book sold well, and the illustration became extremely popular. And even though the picture originally included 15 different primates in a row and was called The Road to Homo Sapiens, the abbreviated version of it became known as the March of Progress. And thus, one of science's most pernicious memes was born. So, what's wrong with this picture? Well, first of all, there are only males in this picture. Humans, like most animals, reproduce sexually, which means we come in two distinct flavors, and they make our existence possible. Teaching the history of our development with only one sex is like trying to eat sushi with only one chopstick. You're just not gonna get it all. Next, we're not even directly related to some of those guys. Like, as Howell himself pointed out, Oreopithecus was kind of a bit player in the human drama. It lived for a few million years in what's now southern Europe, but disappeared rather quickly. And the latest research suggests that it probably wasn't even bipedal, as you see here. Then there's Cro-Magnon. While that was kind of a catch-all phrase for primitive humans 50 years ago, the specimen that the term was based on turned out to be a modern Homo sapien. So they're generally no longer considered to even be a thing. We also did not evolve from Neanderthals, as the picture suggests. Modern humans and Neanderthals actually coexisted until about 40,000 years ago. We were contemporaries with a shared common ancestor. But they turned out to be unable to adapt to all the changes in the world around them, including the arrival of us. And that's by far the most important problem with this image. Evolution isn't a linear process, it doesn't turn one species into another into another. It's really about genetics. Organisms are constantly developing new adaptations, and the ones with the adaptations that make them most fit for their environment end up reproducing more and spreading their genes all over the place. Scientists call that being evolutionarily successful, and there are plenty of other organisms with whom we share ancestors that are just as successful, like chimps and orangutans, because they continue to exist and evolve like we do. If you had to express it visually, the human story probably would look more like an incredible incredibly complex tree, or maybe more of a fractal, with many stubs and branches, some of which extend to the present time while others taper out. But it definitely would not resemble some kind of primate police lineup. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow, and a special thanks to our subbable subscribers without whom... 
So as you can see, the the picture made people think a lot of things about evolution that may or may not be exactly true. So your job right now is to take your packet, open up to the back of your front cover, and answer those questions about evolutionary things, fact or fiction, uh, just to see what you know so far. And then we'll try to remember to answer those at the end of class. So why don't you pause, answer true or false, and come on back and we'll continue. We're back, and our objective is to learn a little bit about the background about evolution, some myths, and some things about biodiversity. So let's get right into it. What are the misconceptions that people have about this idea of evolution? Let's check it out. Myths and misconceptions about evolution. Let's talk about evolution. You've probably heard that some people consider it controversial, even though most scientists don't. But even if you aren't one of those people, and you think you have a pretty good understanding of evolution, chances are you still believe some things about it that aren't entirely right. Things like, Evolution is organisms adapting to their environment. This was an earlier, now discredited theory of evolution. Almost 60 years before Darwin published his book, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed that creatures evolve by developing certain traits over their lifetimes and then passing those on to their offspring. For example, he thought that because giraffes spent their lives stretching to reach leaves on higher branches, their children would be born with longer necks. But we know now that's not how genetic inheritance works. In fact, individual organisms don't evolve at all. Instead, Random genetic mutations cause some giraffes to be born with longer necks, and that gives them a better chance to survive than the ones who weren't so lucky. Which brings us to survival of the fittest. This makes it sound like evolution always favors the biggest, strongest, or fastest creatures, which is not really the case. For one thing, evolutionary fitness is just a matter of how well-suited they are to their current environment. If all the tall trees suddenly died out and only short grass was left, all those long-necked giraffes would be at a disadvantage. Secondly, survival is not how evolution occurs. Reproduction is. And the world is full of creatures like the male anglerfish, which is so small and ill-suited for survival at birth that it has to quickly find a mate before it dies. But at least we can say that if an organism dies without reproducing, it's evolutionarily useless, right? Wrong. Remember, natural selection happens not at the organism level, but at the genetic level. And the same gene that exists in one organism will also exist in its relatives. So a gene that makes an animal altruistically sacrifice itself to help the survival and future reproduction of its siblings or cousins can become more widespread than one that is solely concerned with self-preservation. Anything that lets more copies of the gene pass on to the next generation will serve its purpose. Except, evolutionary purpose. One of the most difficult things to keep in mind about evolution is that when we say things like, genes want to make more copies of themselves, or even natural selection, we're actually using metaphors. A gene doesn't want anything, and there's no outside mechanism that selects which genes are best to preserve. All that happens is that random genetic mutations cause the organisms carrying them to behave or develop in different ways. Some of those ways result in more copies of the mutated gene being passed on, and so forth. Nor is there any predetermined plan progressing towards an ideal form. It's not ideal for the human eye to have a blind spot where the optic nerve exits the retina, but that's how it developed, starting from a simple photoreceptor cell. In retrospect, it would have been much more advantageous for humans to crave nutrients and vitamins rather than just calories. But over the millennia, during which our ancestors evolved, calories were scarce, and there was nothing to anticipate that this would later change so quickly. So, evolution proceeds blindly, step by step by step, creating all of the diversity we see in the natural world. So what's this biodiversity we speak of here? Well, let's take a look. Have you ever... Just looked around at all the living things. There's so many. Bio meaning life. Diversity meaning different. Different types of life. From plants to insects. 
to other insects, to animals. Why, there's just an unlimited amount. Why, there's millions of things. But have you ever noticed some commonalities? Heck, most birds have two eyes, a beak and two feet. Why, why a lot of things have two eyes, even some of these insects. So how is it that they can be so different and yet so similar? Well, it all comes down to this idea of evolution. We have all these similarities because we're probably related in some or many ways. If you think about all of the things are made of cells, cells have many similar parts inside. All plant cells make chlorophyll. All animal cells don't. I mean, how are these things all so similar and yet so different? That's the study or the question that people were trying to answer when they came up with ideas such as evolution. So let's open our packet and find the notes section and see if we can fill in a quick definition. Evolution is a change. A change in what? Inherited traits, which relates to genetics. So we're thinking about genetic traits like phenotypes, which are caused by genotypes. But not just of one person, not just a family, but of a whole population. A population is a group of individuals living in a similar area. A population from one generation to the next, and then to the next, and to the next, until you're extinct, right? This process causes the change that you see in populations of living things over time. And what does that change look like? If we could map it out, it wouldn't look like a list of people in a line. It would look more like a tree, something like this. Here's a really simple example of evolution. So let's see, here's people up at the top. Now they're from a branch that came from and led to other creatures that are similar in the primate family. But it's not showing that we evolved from these creatures that live here today, something deep in the past. So as we go farther down, we're deep, digging deeper into the past. And many other mammals are represented by the zebra-like creature here. And all of the mammals share a lot of characteristics with different animals, but with enough differences to put them into their own categories. And these branches continued back and back until maybe we could trace it to some common ancestor, which could have branched this way to form something that eventually just didn't continue. It died out. It became extinct. In fact, 90% of species that ever lived are now extinct. But their relatives live on and this tree, we could predict, will continue to diversify, creating biodiversity. And that study is called evolution. Now sometimes you hear it called the theory of evolution. It's just a theory. Is it just a guess? Is it a hunch? How do you think of something that is a theory. What do you think of the word theory? Well, in the science context, theory has a much greater meaning. Mathematical or a logical explanation, maybe a model that's capable of predicting the future. That can be tested through experiments. So it's not a hunch, it's not a guess, it's not a hypothesis. It's more of a model. It's more of a way to explain how something works. How would you explain the idea of evolution in that picture that I just was showing you? How do you explain that? Well, that's what the theory of evolution does. Excuse me. Evolution is not simply a guess. So we never say evolution's just a theory. Let's pause and see what theory means in science. We need to get something straight. Evolution by natural selection is a theory. So is climate change. But people keep saying that like it's a bad thing. I get it, I understand your frustration. We're all searching for ultimate hashtag truth and complex challenging ideas don't always fit nice and neatly in our brains. But what is truth? Are there different levels of truth? Are some truths truthier than others? 
Well, I don't know, but I do know this. Science is the absolute best tool we have for understanding how the universe works, and theory is not a four-letter word. If we're gonna trust science together, the least we can do is speak the same language. Words like fact, theory, hypothesis, and law mean something totally different to a scientist than the way they're used in everyday speech. So let's get them straight. Facts are really just observations about the world around us, and we observe things every day, like that it's bright outside when I look out the window, and we often develop explanations for those observations, like, okay, the sun is probably up. Congrats, we just developed a hypothesis. But a hypothesis isn't something you prove, it's something you test. So, let's walk outside. It's bright, the sun is up, hypothesis confirmed. Way to go, we did a science. We often come up with multiple hypotheses to explain an observation. We just eliminate the ones that are wrong. What's left over is not a theory or a law or an ultimate truth. It's just a possible explanation for something, one that can lead us to new hypotheses, which may agree or disagree with the original one. It's a never-ending story, only without the big fluffy dragons. That's so good. When enough hypotheses have gotten the old scientific check mark, we can pile these all up and turn them into something greater, a theory. A theory is the way we know something works. Based on the evidence we've collected and all the hypotheses that we've successfully put to the test, the best thing about a theory is that we can use it to make predictions, and not just about the way things are, but how they will be. You may have heard someone say something like, I have a theory about why cats purr. I think it's because they're actually tiny robots and those are their gears. Well, that's not a theory. That's actually a hypothesis. It's something that could be tested, but don't try this at home. This cycle, taking facts and observations, thinking up possible explanations, testing those explanations, and then making predictions based upon them, that's what this whole science thing is about. Being a theory isn't a bad thing. It means that idea got the gold star, the blue ribbon, a big shiny trophy that says, countless experiments have shown that I'm sufficient to explain all the observations that I encompass. Now, to see if you got this down, let's look at some examples. Fact, people get sick. I think we can all accept that. Hypothesis, people get sick because something gets in their body and starts doing bad things. Test each hypothesis, throw out the bad ones, and we're left with a framework that lets us understand why we get sick and make predictions. The germ theory of disease. Okay, let's try another. Evolution is a fact. We know that it happens, no doubt. But how does it happen? Evolution by natural selection is a theory. We've come up with thousands and thousands of hypotheses about it, tested them, thrown out the bad ones, and we developed a pretty darn good framework for predicting how living things change over time. So yeah, it's a theory. Stop saying it like a bad thing. Calling it a theory means it's past the toughest tests that we can throw at it. And evolution has been tested maybe more than any other theory we know of. We should really call it the theory of the fact of evolution. What about something as fundamental as gravity? Is that a theory or is it a law? In science, a law is a detailed description, usually using math, of how something happens, like the movement of gas molecules related to temperature or how mass and energy are always conserved. But a law doesn't tell us why something happens. Gravity, as it turns out, is a law and a theory. Newton's law of universal gravitation describes precisely how two objects will attract each other based on their masses and the distance between them, and gives us a nice formula we can use to figure it out. Textbook law. But Newton's equation doesn't describe what is happening or why. To do that, we need a theory of gravity. Fact, if I drop this, it'll fall. Law, I can mathematically describe how fast that apple and the earth will accelerate toward one another based on their masses and distance. But why is it happening? Hypothesis, there's a force pulling on the apple, or maybe there's something about the universe and the way it's structured that makes massive things fall toward one another. Or maybe the apple is like magnetically attracted to earth or something. Eliminate the bad ones and we're left with a theory. 
And thanks to Einstein, we've got a theory of gravity called general relativity. But once scientists stumbled upon quantum mechanics, they began to realize that Einstein's relativity didn't account for what was happening on the very smallest gravitational scales in the universe. General relativity is still great at describing the universe at the scale that we interact with it. But even the theory of gravity is incomplete. Does that mean we throw it out because it can't explain everything? No, I mean, if you get a flat tire on your car, do you get a new car? If you change the tire, is your car a different car all of a sudden? All of these fit together to make the scientific machine. We're constantly adding and taking away parts, but it keeps on running just fine. It just means we've got more work to do to make Einstein's theory even more right. Science is never done. It's always changing, and this bothers some people. How can we trust it? How can something be strong and robust if it could be different tomorrow? The goal of science is to devise frameworks that describe how things work, to truly understand why things are the way they are right now so that we can know how things will be in the future. And if we can learn to trust science in all of its fuzziness and incompleteness, I predict that future is going to be very bright. I like that theory. Stay curious. So that really, I mean, that sums it up, right? For what is science and what's it all about and, and how are we trying to get to the answers of how things work? I think it's interesting that you can think of a law in a theory as being different. The law is kind of like the law of conservation of matter or the law of, of um, pressures or something where you can actually mathematically figure things out by plugging into a formula. But the theory tells how it works. And that's why... Theories can be kind of complicated, but they definitely are backed up by lots of science. Nah, I still say it's only a theory. All right, speaking of that, let's take out our questions and see how you guys did on our true-false. We're back. Thanks, guys. Um, let's go through the questions here. Number one, evolution is a theory about the origins of life, like where life came from. Well, mm, I mean, no, definitely not. False. It doesn't tell where life came from and how it began it's just showing how we think things have changed as life evolved but not where it came from in their first place that may be something we can't gather evidence about right so we're not going to be able to answer that question number two evolution is like a climb up a ladder organisms are always getting better well feel like you're at the top of the line of evolution well you are until the whole world floods and then suddenly the swimming creatures are at the top right Who's to say we're at the top? Some things are better at some things than others. We're, there's no top. It's just you fit in really well with your environment until your environment changes, and then it's all up for grabs. So there's no there's no climb. It's number two is false. Three, evolution means that life changed by chance. Well, there is a little bit of randomness in the genetics, but... There's still not randomness, right? You've still got your dominant and recessive. It's not like something just completely changes and you're going to grow a third hand or something like that. That's that's not going to happen. So there are some predictable things that we can look at. There isn't um, ultimate randomness is what I'm saying. So there are still scientific facts that we're looking at. So I would say no, it's not really by chance. Four, natural selection involves organisms trying to adapt. Boy, wouldn't it be great if I had that third hand? be able to manipulate the keyboard and do this and that. You can't try to adapt. You just, you do or you don't. I mean, and it's mostly random because of the genetics leading to something that could or couldn't be better. So no, um, you can't try. Hmm. Five, evolution is just a theory. Well, if you've been watching this video, you know that's false. Gaps in the fossil record provide evolution is wrong. Now, just because we haven't found every fossil doesn't mean we it just means we haven't found every fossil, so it's false. Because you haven't found the proof doesn't mean the proof's not out there. We just haven't found the proof. So six would be false. Seven, evolution's not really science because it's not observable. Or is it? Because what about all those fossils that we find everywhere? What, they're different slightly than the creatures of today. There's your fossilized evidence right there. So you can, and you can actually set up experiments with living things to see if your ideas are on the right track. So that's a false. Eight. If you believe in evolution, you can't believe in religion. Well, the maybe 
father, if we would want to call him, of evolutionary. Charles Darwin was quite religious, and even after he, he published his ideas. So you don't have to change your fundamental beliefs just because evolution is some scientific process that happens in the world. Um, no. You don't have to you don't have to change that. So that's a false. Number nine. People evolve from apes. Well, you know, that picture made people think that, but apes and humans are related by ninety nine point nine percent of the DNA, but they're not from each other. There's some other thing that that branched into apes and then branched into people. And so we wouldn't directly be evolving. So no. Again, false. Uh, many scientists don't agree with evolution. Many? Many? None? No. Evolution is, is pretty scientifically a thing. So that's not really true. There's not really a debate going on among scientists anyway about evolution. So they're all false. These are all things that people have heard and maybe think could be true. They sound true-ish, but they're not true. So thanks for playing along. And I hope you come back next time because we'll finish the rest of the notes and do some more things with evolution. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank you for trying science, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.